Suzanne, uh, thanks for coming in today to talk about your work. Uh, I'm very excited about our conversation because in many ways your work epitomizes uh, the commitment of the school to advancing the science of education and your work really is at the cutting edge and so innovative in that space. Uh, so let's start by uh, talking a little bit about your research and how it, f it focuses on what you call brain training. What, what is that? I'm doing work on brain training so in, in a very broad scope I'm interested in um, investigating the malleability and the development of what we call executive function skills across the lifespan. And uh, one way to do that is we develop games, what you might call brain training games, that target these very specific executive function um, skills in people across the lifespan with the goal to improve those skills. And, and unpack that, that, that term executive function a little bit for the audience. Yes, that's a very critical question here. So executive function uh, means our ability to solve new problems, to resist distractions, to keep uh, information in our mind, uh, inhibiting prepotent uh, responses. So very basic cognitive skills that allow us to do uh, what we would call higher order cognitive skills, uh, reading comprehension or math or uh, complex uh, memory functions. So it's a very underlying cognitive skills that is useful for pretty much everything that we do in our daily life. I know from the literature some people think this is a fixed trait, but you, you right. seem to disagree here. Right, I, I do disagree. So first of all, our executive functions, they develop across our entire life. And there are lots of um, things that impact how well we do in our executive function, ranging from education. So schooling is a very big factor that helps us to develop our executive function skills. Uh, but there are other, um, um, other ways to target these skills as well through, let's say, brain training games, so targeted training. But there could also be other um, ways how we can um, show some of the malleability of these skills. So uh, take a minute to, to describe one of these games you've developed to, to train the brain to develop uh, these executive function skills. Right, so more recently we have been using a lot of uh, tablet-based games, so games that we do um, on tablets with kids, with young adults, with older adults. And um, they are fairly simple, so they are not very exciting games such as um, Angry Birds or even things like World of Warcraft. So they're, they're pretty basic in kind of how they look like. So in a typical game, uh, people would see a stream of objects, could be animal, one after another. And then for each animal, you would have to decide whether it's shown right side up or upside down. And then after a couple of animals, you would have to recall the animals that you saw in order by tapping on a display of uh, various animals that you might have seen. If you do that right, the next sequence will be increasing, uh, will increase by one. So you would have to remember one animal more or even more animals. If you make mistakes, then it's getting uh, easier again. With the idea that we always want to target people's uh, working memory or executive function skills at every moment in time. So it shouldn't be too difficult. So people um, get frustrated and might give up on the task. But it shouldn't be too easy either because otherwise people can just do it automatically and doesn't really target any of these executive function skills that we're interested in. So it sounds like uh, uh, what's special about the games you developed is again kind of optimizing this challenge, this level of right. challenge and difficulty, whereas in another computer game like I think you said War of World of Warcraft, World for of example. Th yeah. th there's some of this is involved, but it's not. It's not really optimized. Um. Well, it could be. So there are a lot of. Um, there's quite a bit of research going into these commercial um, video games too to target people's skills, so the level increase and all that. But in these games, it's way more complex. There are way more processes that are involved in these games, and the graphic design is way more optimized. So one thing that we also. Um, uh, look at in my work, we look at the level of what we would call gamification. So um, ours are very uh, stripped down and very uh, kind of neutral in terms of uh, how they are presented. So they still, our participants, they win points for better performance and they go through different levels that they know, but it's still, it's very, very basic. Um, 
And we have found that if we put in too many levels of gamification, then the danger is that it gets distracting and then it moves away the attention from the actual task that people are, uh, or that we are trying people to do. And then the, the learning is actually decreased. So that's a, a, an interesting um, um, area where we have found uh, ourselves in to try to get this sweet spot between too little gamification. If it's too little, then people might not engage, they get bored, they think it's just something that they don't want to engage with. But if it's too much, then um, it distracts in another level and people don't learn either. So we have to sort of find this sweet spot in between. So that's something that's we're working on right now. Another thing I, I find exceptional about your work is that you think about this uh, cognitive development across the lifespan. And you're particularly uh, often interested in kind of both extremes, right. yeah, early mm -hmm. childhood and uh, um, uh, more mature ages. Uh, why, that, why that focus? Well, originally, so I've been doing this work in the domain of brain training for uh, probably close to 15 years. And, and some of the first studies that we ever did was actually targeting older adults because we were interested to contribute to ways that we could promote successful aging to prevent age-related uh, cognitive decline in some way by targeting some of these executive functions because those are some of the domains that also um, are very susceptible to age-related uh, cognitive decline. So that was sort of the first audience that we were interested in in, in targeting and, and really developing some of the games for this audience before we actually moved uh, to kids. Um, and um, I'm really interested, executive function is interesting because um, it's one of these functions that is impaired in age and is impaired also, or it develops in early childhood as one of these critical skills that also uh, predict how well these kids do in school. And uh, for example, kids from lower SES, um, socioeconomic status, or low income backgrounds typically also struggle with some of these uh, executive function skills. So a lot of these eight um, populations, they struggle with executive function. So all of them could benefit uh, potentially from targeted training, including then older kids, um, for example, with uh, attention hyperactivity, uh, um, deficit disorder, for example, or, or um, people with major depression, even it, executive functions is typically one of the, the first cognitive skills that is impaired in these populations. And therefore, we can really target um, participants uh, pretty much across the lifespan and in a very broad range of uh, different domains. And there's, uh, I understand from your work in the literature that there's a, a complex set of causes for uh, this variation in individual uh, uh, individual performance and, and uh, capacity here. What are what are some of the factors uh, contributing to this? Oh, that's a good question. So there are a lot of individual differences exactly that um, uh, predict how well we do in these uh, cognitive function tasks. And one uh, could be the range of experiences that people are uh, exposed to when it comes to um, uh, kids that grow, on, uh, grow up in suboptimal circumstances, for example, they get very little exposure to um, uh, tasks or maybe environments that require executive function skills. And uh, also stress, for example, early lifehood stress is very, uh, that has a very detrimental effect of, on the development of uh, what we call the prefrontal cortices, so areas in the brain that make us do better or worse, worse in executive function skills. So, um, so prefrontal development is one of these major issues and there are a lot of um, things that can impact the development of our prefrontal functioning, ranging from stress experiences to um, maybe other things, also toxins or um, again, a lack of experiences or age. <laughs> there are a lot of uh, issues that might impact that. and. Um, but interestingly enough, then it, um, my work, but others' work uh, also has shown that we can mitigate to some extent some of these effects of um, these suboptimal developments using some of our targeting games. Yeah, 
And when you when you uh, when you're talking about age-related declines in particular, this is of, of growing importance for our community and, and for the for the country, right? Can you right. can you speak a little bit about uh, uh, why that's so? All right. So we are getting older. Our population is getting older, and there's a, a very high risk that um, a very large proportion of our aging population will. Um, experience the effects of age-related cognitive decline and the considerable portion also will develop some form of uh, dementia. Um, and we know of uh, several factors that might impact the, our successful aging or the prevention to some extent of age-related declines so ranging from uh, uh, nutrition to physical exercise, uh, education is one very big aspect as well. Um, uh, people talk about um, the cognitive reserve hypothesis. So how much do you um, bring into your old age in terms of um, uh, healthy lifestyles that you have um, um, experienced uh, over the course of your life? So these are some of the, the aspects that seem to uh, impact how well we age. Um, but then there's also other factors um, that we can do when we, when we get older in order to also um, keep our minds sharp. And some of them have been shown to be things like uh, cognitive exercises, being cognitively active, uh, but also physical exercise, again, and nutrition and, and being social, um, um, doing volunteer work in your community. These are all things that seem to promote healthy aging. But the, the thing is that our population is getting older, so um, there are more um, uh, impacts in terms of uh, our economy because it, um, if someone is um, um, showing age-related cognitive decline, it is um, hard for them to make everyday decisions such as uh, taking care of ourselves or um, our spouses, to make healthcare decisions, to make financial decisions. So it's a very big toll on our economy and, and having tools to mitigate some of these age-related cognitive declines. That's something that's interesting and important to me. Mm. Yeah, and, I, and I said before, your work is really cutting edge and the, you know, the games are an example of that. But then I also think of this, this other work you're doing with the electrical stimulation. All right. Can, can, you, de can, you, de can you describe that for uh, the audience? Right, so uh, one part of my work uh, focuses on ways how we can improve the efficacy of some of our interventions because what we have seen is that not everyone benefits to the same extent on, uh, from these training interventions. So some people show a lot of improvement and they also show some improvements that go beyond what, what uh, we have been training on, so showing so-called transfer or generalizing effects. But some people don't really to see, uh, seem to show a lot of improvement. And we have tried, or my um, uh, current work tries to really build on or trying to figure out what, what are factors that we can use to boost the benefits of uh, training. And one of these factors or one of these tools that we have found to be potentially um, helpful is uh, by the means of uh, electrical stimulation. So we're using something that's called transcranial, transcranial direct current stimulation, which is a neuromodulatory uh, technique that um, impacts the electrical current in our brain by putting a um, low, um, uh, low, very low electrical current at uh, different parts of your brain. So it's very low, right? This very, is, very these low. Are, these aren't like the earlier uh, uh, experiments of, of turning the the electricity up on No, yeah, it's <laughs> very, very low. So you might think of TMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation, in which we actually um, elicit action potentials, and uh, you can really inhibit uh, or boost the functioning of the brain. But in our variant, it's very mild electrical current. So it's, um, it's a nine volt battery, pretty much, that you, um, uh, you use to elicit um, uh, electrical currents to your brain. And what it does, again, it doesn't elicit any action potentials, but it can lower or the threshold of uh, firing potentially, which then provides a little window of better uh, plasticity. Um, so the idea is that if you pair that little window of uh, changed plasticity with a training event, so when you pair it with cognitive training, 
we might see better learning in, in, in people that we stimulate with our uh, intervention. And we actually do see that. So when we pair TDCS, so electrical stimulation, with our brain training, people do seem to improve more over time as compared to someone who's just getting shame stimulation, so in which we don't really uh, ramp up their current uh, while they're doing the training. Um, and not only that, they show better training, but they also uh, generally show longer uh, or better long-term effects as well. So typically we see a little bit of a fade out effect after a couple of months. When you don't train anymore, some of your training effects will wane, which is maybe not surprising. So if you think of physical exercise, if you go running for a month and then you stop running and then you get back and, and uh, get maybe um, a test on your fitness ability anymore, you will not see very much remaining benefits anymore. But if you would keep running, uh, then that's something that you might expect. So the same with our brain training as well. If you train for a month and then you stop, you might not see or expect a lot of remaining um, effects there. But what we found, which is really interesting with TDCS, we found remaining effects up to one year after training completion. So they look like they haven't really forgotten anything about their uh, training or on their performance. Yeah, and uh, some of your measurement also is really at the forefront of, of the field uh, because not only are you assessing uh, cognitive performance, executive function in, in, uh, with traditional measures, but uh, you're also using the, the F fMRI uh, magnet we, uh, right. on campus mm -hmm. as well. Can you do Yes. Can, so, uh, can you describe what that is right. and, and how you're uh, deploying it in your research? Right. So we have a new brain imaging center on campus, Fiber, um, and I'm pretty excited to be a part of this uh, growing community on campus. Um, this is very exciting. Yes, some of my work has also looked at um, neural activity as a function of training. So we typically look at so we would put participants in that magnet, so the magnetic uh, resonant uh, imaging uh, tomography, that's uh, what it's called. Um, so we uh, put people in the scanner and we image uh, people's brains before the training and then they would do a training and then we image them again after training uh, to see uh, whether some of the behavioral changes that we see also have some neural correlates and if so, what these are and what are uh, some of the brain areas in which we see uh, changes. Um, and uh, yeah, we have done a, a couple of studies uh, looking at these and uh, we're hoping to do more in this, in this new uh, imaging center here on campus. Mm. That's great. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested in, uh, when I have these conversations with faculty, I'm always very interested to know what were the personal factors that led to this trajectory where they spent their life working on educational research and thinking about education in the brain. So going back to uh, <laughs> your, your uh, adolescence or uh, uh, your childhood, what, what, what motivated you to this path that you took professionally? Well, that's an interesting question. So I've been interested in how people learn for a really long time, but I don't think I've thought about these questions very much uh, growing up. So when I chose to study psychology, I'm, I started studying psychology as an undergrad with the aim to go into clinical psychology and counseling psychology. I actually do have a master's degree in, in counseling and, and clinical psychology and psychotherapy research, but I'm not doing any of this well, or very little about this uh, uh, at this point. Um, there are always a lot of maybe chances or, or it could be some things along the way that happened that really got me interested in, in executive function and, and working memory. So as an undergrad, I w was really interested in, in trying to understand um, what people do or how people deal with um, capacity limits. So if we give them a very difficult task, how do they deal with difficult tasks and, and um, how do they deal with failure and how do they overcome failure? So that was really one of the reasons why I became interested in that. And um, the other thing too is um, then related to that, I thought, oh, well, maybe we can also train people to get better at 
um, dealing with um, working at these capacity limits or maybe then some of these capacity limits that we see sometimes can be overcome through targeted training. So that was still in my um, master's degree where we started to develop some of these training interventions because we came across some, some work that has shown the benefits of working memory training on um, something what we would call fluid intelligence, fluid reasoning, problem solving, and, and we were kind of a little bit skeptical that this would actually work because there has been a lot of common knowledge out there or discussion that, as you mentioned earlier, this is something, this is an ability that we're born with that's fixed. There's really nothing we can do about it. And this work that came out of uh, Sweden uh, suggested, no, 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 there's some targeted training that seemed to be showing um, that this can be malleable. And first, we didn't really believe it at all. We can try to replicate that, but let's do it better or let's do it differently. And that was really the start of, of doing that work in um, in that uh, domain. But that was still in psychology. So I'm an experimental psychologist and a neuroscientist by training. So I had very little interaction with any education research um, um, uh, at my university in Switzerland. I Both my parents are teachers, but that was the exposure of education that I, I had at that time. So I didn't think I would do anything in that um, area. And also as a postdoc, that's when I came here to the States a little bit over 10 years ago. I was in, in neuroscience and cognitive science. That's the thing that I was doing. But I was always interested in trying to use the work that I would do in a more applied setting. So working in schools, for example, or working in older adults um, uh, to see how some of these interventions would benefit people in their daily life. And this is not typically something that cognitive or experimental psychologists and neuroscientists are very interested in. Um, so I was at Maryland before coming here to UCI, um, um, also in the psychology department and the program of neuroscience. But I had a lot of interactions there with the College of Education. So I have a still ongoing collaborations with there, which really emphasized more the importance of doing that work in, in education. So when I got the chance to uh, come to UCI and, and, and work in the, the School of Education, it was kind of a, a good fit because my, my work is really interdisciplinary um, at the intersection of cognitive psychology and neuroscience and, and education and um, the School of Education, what I found, and also UCI in general, I experienced that as being highly interdisciplinary. So in that sense, I, I'm I'm happy to be here at UCI and doing that work, that interdisciplinary work here. Mm -hmm. uh, so much of your work here at UCI School of Education has been focused on doctoral training. You're the advisor to uh, one of our doctoral student groups, the Decade Group, um, and you've trained so many of our doctoral students here. Uh, what advice would you give to a someone considering going into a PhD program and uh, or in their early years? Hmm. That's a good question. Yes, so I'm the faculty mentor for UCI for the School of Education, uh, School of Education's Decade group. Decade has the aim to diversify um, our doctoral students um, uh, and, and really to promote um, inclusive excellence uh, in our doctoral program. So I'm very happy to be serving in this role uh, to really help the trajectory of incoming doctoral students uh, more and more that are coming from um, uh, a diverse set of backgrounds or being first generation doctoral students, some of which might have never thought of being or becoming a doctoral student with it's the same for me as well. So no one in my family has a doctoral degree and, and very few of them even went to uh, college. So this is very exciting to me uh, to be able to, um, to also bring back some of these um, or, or help out these uh, upcoming uh, doctoral students. And yes, I, I also work with a, a fairly big group in, in my lab of doctoral students here at the School of Education, but also in, in cognitive science. And we have a very big interdisciplinary group um, that I mentor, 
but not only doctoral students, uh, but also we have a very big group of undergraduates who work with me um, every quarter. So with me, or I have to say, with my doctoral students in the in the various uh, projects. So currently we have about um, 50 to 60 undergraduates who work um, in my lab every, every quarter. And, and this is also very important because it's also a very diverse uh, upcoming group of uh, undergraduates, um, most of them first generation, uh, many of them um, uh, Latino or from other uh, minority backgrounds, again, who might have never thought of considering, doctor considering doctoral training. So uh, being able to expose them to research and showing them what we can do and um, showing them that research can actually have practical applications for, uh, that are relevant for people in, in their daily life. So when it comes to our training, that's maybe the most um, glaring example. So we are hoping to improve learning in these populations that can benefit how well they're doing in school or how well uh, they age and they see the importance of, of research and they start to consider uh, uh, doctoral degrees and we have always lots of uh, undergrads who then come to me and ask oh I could apply to these master's program or even PhD programs I'm the first one in my family to even consider that and, and working in, in uh, my lab with the doctoral students and with me has opened some of their perspectives that this is indeed a, uh, a possibility for them. And it's also something that's not just something vague, theoretical, they would just sit there and write books. No, they can actually make an impact in, in other people's lives. So that's something that's very important to me, having this applied um, uh, view. <laughs> yeah, so one of these undergraduate students comes to you and says, I'm thinking about applying for a doctoral student uh, and I'm looking at some schools of education. What would you have them, what would you advise them to look for in, in picking their program? Right, um, that's a good question, of course. So one thing that's um, the first step is, which is sometimes not very easy to them, is what it is, what is it that they actually want to do in terms of the topic? So they have to have some idea of what it is that they're actually interested in. And then the next part is I, I try to um, help them if I can or, or give them some hints about, um, well, look for some advisors or look for some, some people who do the work that you are interested in, in doing. And then I, I ask them also, well, reach out to these people and reach out whether they would be interested in, t in taking doctoral students to talk to them about the benefits uh, of the program. And um, I also try to make them interested in um, um, seeing the benefits of having interdisciplinary programs. So not just being in one specific niche or just one specific advisor because things can also change um, often in these undergrads because they're still uh, in the beginning sometimes they're not clear exactly of what it is that they want to do and they find out along their way so being in a program that is open that is interdisciplinary um, facilitates some of their um, potential changes to in, in their trajectories and, and I think the School of Education here um, does that because it is interdisciplinary and, in, and it also encourages uh, incoming doctoral students to work with different advisors um, and, and even work with um, across different programs even uh, to take classes in other programs to work with advisors from different uh, programs. To, um, in the end I think that benefits their trajectory as upcoming scholars. Well, Suzanne, thank you so much for coming in today and sharing uh, a little bit about your work and uh, your ideas about doctoral training and your, and your background with us here today. All right.